Hello, webinar attendees. My name is Marisol Morales, and I serve as the Vice President for Network Leadership with Campus Compact. We're very happy to have you be part of um, the second year of our Campus Compact National Webinar Series and our first uh, webinar of the year titled Picturing Community Engagement, What We Say Through Images and Why It Matters with our wonderful and talented presenters, David Donahue and Susan Munkris. Uh, but before I begin with the introductions, I just wanted to remind folks of the other webinars that we have in this series, um, and that if you haven't had a chance to sign up, please go ahead and do so on our Campus Compact website, compact.org. Uh, there is a two-step process, so you register through there, and then um, closer to the webinar, you will get uh, an opportunity to access a link that will give you the link for the webinar um, for the, the date. Um, I also want to remind folks that uh, to tune in for our podcast series, Podcast Nation, our uh, fourth season, first episode, uh, will be dropping on September 25th. Um, that podcast is co-hosted by the president of Campus Compact, Andrew Seligson, uh, Emily Shields, the director of Minnesota and Iowa Campus Compact, and myself, um, and it's great fun. So please tune in on any a podcast app that you like um, and you can review us and rate us you won't want to miss that and then also encourage folks uh, registration is open for our national campus compact conference in seattle march 28th through april 1st so we'd love to see you there so let's start off with introductions um, first i'd like to introduce my friend uh, Dave Donahue. Uh, Dave is the director of the McCarthy Center for Public Service and Common Good at the University of San Francisco. Uh, David joined uh, the McCarthy Center as a senior director in 2015 before coming to the University of San Francisco. David was the interim provost and associate vice provost at Mills College in Oakland, uh, California, and worked there for more than 20 years as a professor of education. David earned his doctorate an education from Stanford University after earning a Bachelor's of Arts in History as a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Brown University. Uh, David is widely published scholar on topics including service learning and higher education, human rights and diversity, and personal identity. He came to University of San Francisco committed to the continuation of building a strong community while leading the McCarthy Center in its mission of helping to inspire and prepare USF students for lives and careers in ethical public service. So welcome, David. Thank you. Our second presenter is Susan Munkras. Susan is the director of the Office of the Community University Partnerships and Service Learning at the University of Vermont. Uh, she's a sociologist by training. Dr. Munkras has been with the CUPS office since 2012 and has served as director since January of 2013. Susan works primarily with faculty and community partners to develop pedagogically rigorous and reciprocal experiences that benefit both UVM students and community partners. And we're excited to have them as um, our first webinar of this series and really putting us in the position to think about the images that we use in our centers and the work that we do. At this point, I'll turn it over to our two presenters. Thank you guys. All right, thank you, Marisol. And welcome to everybody who's uh, watching the webinar. And thank you for joining us on your Tuesday afternoon. And I hope the new school year is going well for um, folks as well as this day. We're gonna be talking about imagery in community engagement, service learning, and it does feel like a really important topic. I um, come to this topic not because I'm in marketing and communications, I'm not a visual artist, uh, I'm not even a photographer beyond the occasional selfie with a dog on Facebook for anybody who's a friend of mine on Facebook. But um, I did start to think about imagery when I um, started to think about integrating the arts into my own teaching. And it just gave me a new way of looking at the world and, and the power of images, which I then turned to thinking about service learning and community engagement. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the um, webinar today, but Susan, do you want to say anything else by way of introduction too? Um, just that I had been thinking about this in my own work as we were compiling representations of service learning and community engagement and did a lit search and tried to find work. This was just before your article got published um, and felt like it was a huge need to think 
critically about the images that we use to put service learning forward. So when I discovered your, your, the research you're going to present on today, it was really, um, really an opportunity to, to look at how others were starting to think about this. So I'm really delighted to be able to help get some of this information out to other practitioners and interested folks. Good. So today we'll be a little bit about sharing some research just to give an overall framing for thinking about imagery in our work and then a little bit about the thinking, how do we apply some of that knowledge to the work we do and what questions does that raise that then we might want to talk about with each other today. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a um, story uh, regarding uh, how I came to this topic and this project. And it started with doing a PowerPoint slideshow on service learning for a conference presentation a couple of years ago. And for those of you who have done Google searches for images, maybe you know the kind of rabbit hole you can go down when you start searching the web for images. But I just did a Google search for images of service learning. And what I got were a ton, and I mean a ton of pictures of gardens, like a lot of pictures of gardens, more gardens, gardens everywhere, people hoeing in gardens, people planting flowers in gardens, people um, showing their work in front of greenhouses. I mean, just lots of gardening photos. And this made me ask the question, like, why are there so many pictures of gardens on the web for service learning? And you know, I speculated that there could be a couple reasons. One is if you look at some of those pictures, and I'll just scroll back, and they're awfully pretty, they're colorful, there's a lot of greenery. So there's definitely an aesthetic element to why so many pictures of gardens. Um, you know, who doesn't like fresh fruits and vegetables? There's something just appealing about the topic. Um, gardens also bring people together. Uh, if you think about schools as places where people too often sit behind desks or sit in lecture halls, gardens provide an opportunity to get outside, get fresh air, um, enjoy each other's company. There's ways in which too the research shows that gardens um, actually as part of a service learning project can uh, boost students' self-esteem, self sense of self-efficacy. So are there other positive reasons for thinking about why there might be so many gardens in all these images? Um, it's a break from the passive learning routines we find so often in school. But as I thought about like why so many pictures of gardens, I also had like this other aspect to the question. Why are there so many pictures that are like gardens? And as I think about community engagement, um, and service learning, I think of it as a real vehicle for preparing young people to think about political engagement, to think about contentious issues in their community um, as a way to bring together diverse individuals who learn from each other's perspectives. And in a lot of the pictures of gardens, I wasn't seeing that. In fact, Gardens seem to be not very representative of the diversity that exists in higher education, um, at least in the photos I was seeing online. Gardening is often um, not a very politically contentious or politically engaging activity. Um, I mean, I suppose it could be if there was something that led you to believe that students were growing a garden that was protesting Monsanto's Roundup, um, uh, fertilizers and chemicals, or if you thought students were um, squatting and um, protesting food deserts in certain neighborhoods. But most pictures never give you that sense. It's just people looking happy, planting flowers or vegetables. And so that raises this question for me about um, why that is. And so um, the goals today in this webinar are really to think a bit about what does the imagery tell us about community engagement. And the image that's on this slide is um, one of the most popular images that pops up if you do a Google image search, or at least I did this summer when I got this one, for um, service learning. And this picture of gardening uh, popped up. We're hoping today that um, by spending this time together, we can get a little bit more of a critical lens on the imagery that's used to illustrate community engagement and that um, 
we can understand maybe why the imagery is the way it is. Uh, if we're not happy about this, we might think, well, shouldn't we just solve this problem? And in fact, um, there's some dilemmas around selecting imagery, finding images for uh, making points about community engaged learning and service learning. And so we'll explore some of those. We also hope that today's an opportunity for all of us to reimagine communication about community engagement and to imagine what could be. So to begin, I'd like to just do a little bit of framing to think about imagery. And you can see on this slide, four different quotes about images generally. Um, you can read them, so I don't need to do that, but I'd like to say a little bit about each one. Um, this first quote about producing effects every time we look at images, I think speaks to the power of images. And we can all think of images in our lives that are very powerful. They could be images that we've seen in um, newspapers about world events. Um, I think about the images I've recently seen from the Bahamas of destruction from a hurricane there and the way they move me. And um, that speaks, I think, to the power of images. Um, we all know of images that can really move us. Uh, I could describe an image of um, my recently passed on mother that I found and I just could look at that picture for hours because of the way it makes me feel. Um, this second quote about the more we know, the more we see, I think um, speaks to the fact that while images have great power, they don't have to have power over us. We can um, make sense of images, we can challenge them, we can critique them, and hopefully today, we'll all get a little bit smarter about how to do that, particularly the images we use in our own work on our websites and our brochures and our recruiting material. This third quotation about how um, our culture is overwhelmingly visual, I think speaks to the omnipresence of images and the way in which as um, we think about our work in education as teachers, um, the role that imagery, whether they're still images or moving images, have become even more and more important in our own teaching, um, not just the words we use. And this fourth quotation here about a third space speaks to, I think, how we make meaning from images. And we'll, um, we'll be inhabiting some of that third space today as we look at images of community engagement. Um, what Stevenson and Deasy mean by a third space is that um, there are three spaces. Think of the image itself as a space. Think of the head you have um, where you're like receiving the image as another space. And think of what's in between as this third space. So if you imagine the first space as being a picture of a dog, I can't in the second space just say, I think it's a cat. Because um, there's something about that picture that most people would say it's a dog. But there's something in between what I think it is and what it is that is about meaning. And so I might look at a picture of a dog and in that third space say, oh my God, that dog reminds me of Blue. Blue is the best dog I ever had and I sure miss Blue. Or, you know, it reminds me of another dog, um, a naughtier dog, not one of my favorite dogs, whatever. But there are associations, um, stories, histories that come with images. And all of that plays into this third space as we make meaning of pictures. Um, I want to say a little bit about um, the process of how we make meaning from images. And um, this is just taking off a little bit from that idea of the third space that I just introduced. Um, images are encoded with messages and we decode the messages that we see. And as we, and I think I gave an example of, there's a picture of a dog, you can't say it's something totally different. On the other hand, there's a process that you go through to decide what that image means to you and how you interpret it. Paul talks about as we make meaning from images, we have three social positions. One is dominant, one is oppositional, and the other is negotiated. And we've probably been in all three positions at some point. And I'll illustrate what those mean by talking about how we might respond to imagery, particularly in advertising, which I think is the kind of imagery 
that is um, probably most likely to provoke these different stances in us. So think about some imagery you may have seen in advertisements for prescription medicines from Big Pharma. Um, maybe you've seen ads for products that you know make you think, gosh, my skin is dry and itchy, or hmm, I have been feeling bloated lately. Um, that would mean you're responding from a dominant position. You're responding in the way that the person who's created those images wants you to. And there's congruence between the way the image is encoded and the way you're decoding it. You might respond to some imagery, and um, it's interesting about imagery around pharmaceutical drug ads, from an oppositional perspective. Um, maybe you would look at those same ads and think, oh my gosh, this is an effort to just manipulate me, to create a syndrome in me that like, I didn't think it even was a problem, but they're just trying to get me to think it's a problem, so I'll spend money and boost their profits. That's an oppositional stance in terms of thinking about imagery, where clearly the pharmaceutical company doesn't want you to think they're trying to game you or um, manipulate you. Um, but if you're responding that way, your response is in opposition to how the image is encoded. And very often what we do is we negotiate images. We're somewhere in between. We're not just accepting them in a dominant perspective. We're not totally oppositional, just dismissing them, but we're negotiating the meaning. We're trying to figure out what does that mean? Even if it's a drug ad from um, a big pharmaceutical company, we might be trying to think, hmm, I wonder if I do need to be worried about getting um, you know, a flu shot this year. And what is, you know, should I get it from this drugstore? Um, so negotiation is very typically how we make meaning from imagery. Um, that negotiation is happening in the third space that I referred to. This final quotation on this page about visual imagery never being innocent, that it's always constructed through various practices, technologies, and knowledges, I think has um, really important implications for the work we do in community engagement and service learning. When it says that visual imagery is never innocent, it doesn't mean that it's inherently evil either. But what it does mean is that as we think about the images that we put in our brochures and our websites and our um, publications, whether we're consciously doing it or not, we are encoding those messages and setting people up to decode them in certain ways. And we could be sending messages, for example, about different kinds of people and um, the ways in which we think they can operate in the world. And so thinking about community engagement and service learning, we could be encoding or prompting the decoding of mess images in ways that lead people to decide, hmm, I think certain kinds of people serve. I think certain kinds of people need service. We could be encoding those images with some of our own biases, stereotypes, assumptions, and it's good to interrogate those and we'll do some of that today. It's also good to think about, are the images we choosing in some ways limiting the way people think about service learning and community engagement, or could we be opening that up to new possibilities? Um, taking some of those questions seriously, I actually wanted to do um, a real investigation into the visual culture of community engagement and service learning. Um, and so what I did was a content analysis um, and an audiencing, a two-part study, the first part quantitative, the second part qualitative to understand more deeply what the imagery that um, colleges and universities means to um, convey messages about service learning and community engagement. And I'll say a little bit about the database um, of images in uh, the next slide. But for the first part of the um, study, the quantitative part, it was just purely a content analysis to look at pictures on college and university websites and see, are they portraying service or are they not portraying service? Is it direct service, meaning directly helping people, or is it indirect service, meaning somehow making the world a better place indirectly that will ultimately help people? And are the images political, and by that I guess I should have said contentious, or apolitical, and maybe a better word would have been non-contentious. Um, for the audiencing part that we'll get to later, audiencing is like a way of thinking about focus groups to understand more about how are people in their third spaces making sense of um, some of this imagery. So the images that I chose, I um, had a wonderful graduate student who helped me collect them all. Um, there were 834 images from um, 
63 college and university websites in California. Um, these were colleges and universities that specifically had websites uh, or web pages, I should say, devoted to service learning and community engagement on campus. Of those 63, um, 36 were private. Um, about half of them were religiously affiliated. Um, you can see another group were um, large um, California state universities, public institutions, and nine were University of California campuses, meaning very large research intensive universities. Um, one of the interesting things is of those 80, um, 834 photos, um, more than half did not even show service. They show things like the buildings we work in. They show things like group photos of us um, standing outside the buildings we work in. They show pictures of the leaders on our campus, the student leaders that we're really proud of who are doing the work and um, leading the work. Um, there are lots of pictures of award ceremonies where um, we're recognized for our work as we should be, um, but lots of images celebrating our work. Um, here's another image of a uh, celebration of service. I have no idea who the dinosaur is with the beanie in the background, but people are looking awfully happy there. Um, when you think about the images that did have service, about 834, we're talking 391, um, the number one uh, category of images was not gardens, to my surprise, given what had initially spurred this uh, research. It was in fact, and now that I know this, it's no surprise because I see these images everywhere. It was pictures of our college students working with young people outside of classrooms. Could be on the soccer field, could be at a Halloween party, could be at um, you know, some kind of athletic event. Lots of pictures of working with young people outside the classroom. Gardening though wasn't far behind. It did come in at number two. There's a lot of pictures of um, people working in gardens or restoring habitats. Lots of pictures of um, working in classrooms uh, with students tutoring or being reading buddies. Lots of pictures of what I called painting and hammering. I didn't want to call it building houses because I'm never sure they're actually building a house. Um, as someone who has taken students on Habitat for Humanity, um, days of service, I have felt uniquely um, unskilled and incapable to do much that contributes to building a house beyond sweeping sawdust, but it does something, I guess. But you see lots of pictures of people at construction sites. You see lots of people um, in international service, and this photo is interesting because it raises some of the tropes around um, the racial identities that um, people see in lots of photos of community engagement and service learning and what messages those might encode in terms of who does service and who needs service. There are pictures of, um, and at this point, the numbers are dropping off quite a bit in terms of the frequency that you see them. Uh, there are still a fair number of pictures of people working with and serving the elderly, working in soup kitchens and food banks, responding to disasters, and working with animals. Um, in total, of all the pictures of service, 98% of them were direct service, people working with other humans. The few examples of indirect service were things like people working at college service fairs or um, doing some fundraising drives. The lack of partisan politics or democratic contention in the photos is also striking as well. Um, very few photos that uh, we coded as politically contentious. To give you some examples of what we did code that way were pictures of flyers that students had um, produced saying, uh, educate, agitate, organize. Um, pictures of um, students marching behind a banner where they were wearing Obama t-shirts. It wasn't clear that they were campaigning for Obama. They might've been doing some other kind of service, but they were wearing Obama t-shirts. So we thought, well, that could be maybe considered politically contentious. Um, people working with food, not bombs, and um, wearing those t-shirts as well, which is more of a political um, orientation to thinking about um, handing out food to those who are homeless in our community. Um, and an LGBTQ comic book project, which, you know, depending on the community you're in, might be considered politically contentious. Um, and so we coded it that way as well. But in total, you can see the images that we're putting out there are sending messages 
that service learning and community engagement is for the most part about helping people directly and it's not really about any kind of controversy. Um, so I wanted to find out a little bit more about um, how do the students that we work with use some of these photos and um, what imagery or what meaning do they make if we could tap into some of like their thinking in the third space. And so before I share some of that, um, Research, I hope that you can um, share with us today some of your thinking around some of that imagery. And I'll ask you to do that by typing it into the um, chat uh, function here on the webinar so that we can see a little bit about what you're thinking. I'm gonna show you two pictures uh, from the database of 834 photos. These are two pictures that we showed to undergraduates as well to get their thoughts. But before I tell you what they thought, let's see what we think. Um, I'd like you to look at the pictures and um, think about, does the image portray service? Yes or no? Um, and I guess what I'll ask you to type in are your thoughts around these questions. Um, what do you notice about the identities of the persons in the photo that you think might be relevant? What do you notice about their race or what might you decode about their class or any other relevant aspects of their identity? And why do you think this photo was included in a service learning web page? for a college and university. So here's the first photo. This is a photo from a private four-year religiously affiliated college in California. And so I'm gonna ask you to type in, oops, sorry, I went ahead there, what you see. What do you notice about the identities of people in this photo and what reasoning or what thinking do you think was behind choosing this photo to include it in a website? So I'm seeing one person who's saying it doesn't portray service, seeing comments about racial diversity, seeing questions about friendly connections, seeing somebody note white savior complex, somebody thinking about mentorship, services helping, not, um, oops, now we're going really fast. <laughs> Community engagement is often white female students, so this is unsurprising to me. Deep connections could be service. People seem happy and enjoying each other. Could be babysitting, so maybe it's not service attempt to display diversity, which um, maybe is hinting at a degree of cynicism or, um, well, or at least intentionality uh, on the part of the person who chose the photo. Um, let's see what else we have. Education showing service in urban areas, which is interesting to think about why we think this is an urban photo. Because um, I actually don't know a lot of the context for these photos. The websites don't provide much um, context. This is great. Thank you for those responses. You have raised a number of issues that um, I think we'll get back to, and I'm glad that you've engaged in some of your own thinking to think critically about these images. Let me show you the next image, and same questions. What do you notice about the identities of people in the photo? Um, do you think it's even service? And why do you think someone would have chosen that photo? Oops. There we go. So go to town on this one. My students will tell you I am the king of wait time as well, so I'm really comfortable waiting while people think. So some questions about whether it is service, maybe because it's drawing less obviously on some of our implicit images of service, people noticing that um, there are more people of color in this photo, if not primarily people of color, people wondering if it's a classroom, 
people thinking about mentorship, people noting the affect of people in the photo, that they seem to be happy, laughing. Um, somebody commenting that it feels equitable. That's an um, interesting word, equitable. And to think about what is it about the photo that's conveying an equitable relationship, which makes me wonder, did people see the first photo as not being as equitable a relationship? And why might that be? Would that be because of the um, ages of the people involved or the races of the people involved, or if we thought it was international service, could it be about the um, nationality or citizenship um, status of the people involved? Somebody noting that it could be service, but perpetuates the people of color the ones that need help, and the word help is in quotation marks. The use of quotation marks is really interesting to think about because. Um, it implies a degree of irony as we think about what these um, photos might convey. Um, noting that it might feel like a laboratory and that could be heightened by the sense that I'm not sure how to interpret this, but one person in the photo seems to be wearing a, a white lab coat. Um, people noticing the individualized attention and personal connection. People noting the um, age diversity in the uh, photo. People looking that just looks like fun. I mean, there's that kid just trying to stifle a laugh that um, probably having a good time that day with that group of people. Um, this is great. Thank you for those comments on the photos. Um, I'm gonna connect some of those comments to um, some of the audiencing we did at Mills College. Uh, Marisol mentioned that was where I was on the faculty for, um, gosh, two decades. Um, and we did some audiencing with a small group of students there. Um, you can see a little bit about the diversity of those students at Mills. It was a very small group of 14, but there were multiple kinds of intersecting diversity in that group. And they were enrolled in a course where they were thinking about um, social justice and change and leadership. So they were primed to be doing some of that um, thinking around um, how to decode these messages. Um, when they looked at those images, um, and they looked at more of them, by the way, they got to see a, a group of 15 randomly chosen images from three different colleges, one um, private institution, one California State University, and one UC. Um, they noticed that primarily the people in the roles that they thought were serving uh, they perceive them as white. And again, this is about how people were decoding the images. We don't know if the people in the images would consider themselves white or whether they would have thought that they were serving even, but this is how people decoded those images. And the power is in what the images send as messages and how they're received. So that was one thing that people noticed. They also noticed that most of the people that they perceived as being served were people of color. Um, and when they saw people of color being in positions of serving, it um, raised a degree of cynicism, which I think um, you know, is interesting. I think in some of your comments, I don't know if that's what you were um, hinting at also when you said attempting to show diversity and that word attempting means, is it a half-hearted attempt? Is it a cynical attempt? Or I mean, it could also be a very sincere, honest attempt too, but um, knowing that there are conscious choices that go into making some of these choices. Um, when we think about that first photo that was being audienced, um, the students, they looked at it and they said on the plus side, you know, we can see that um, maybe this person that we perceive as serving is making a difference in the lives of youth. And they definitely had comments around the bonds that seemed to be very genuine and warm between the two of them. But there were a lot of comments um, from students. Some of you used the words white savior complex explicitly because they were familiar with that term. And by that, they meant that, you know, a white person feeling like I need to go in and fix some situation or I need to help someone and taking charge of things. Um, interestingly, a lot of the students who were commenting on this did something that you did too in your comments. Um, I noticed that the word help was in quotation point, uh, marks at one point. And um, students at Mills who were doing the audiencing for this use the words serving and help in quotation marks quite frequently for uh, this photo, which would in indicate some question about whether it really was help or really was service um, and who was being helped or served. As they looked at the second photo, um, 
they had many more positive comments and associations with them, that they saw happiness, ease, and enjoyment all around, that they saw people having a good time, uh, that their relationships seemed more reciprocal, that it was harder to tell who was serving and who was being served, and that felt really important to them, particularly because this image was um, perceived to have a majority, if not entirely, people of color in it. Um, one student wrote, it's ambiguous as to who the service people are, and it's truly diverse in ethnicity. Another said, there's not a clear power dynamic in this photograph. Who is serving? I like that. Um, so finally, to wrap up some of this, if you think about the aggregate of what we learned from all these pictures, we learned that um, it was pictures were mostly showing people engaged in charity work. It wasn't clearly connected to service learning, uh, to social justice. That um, individual achievement was pictured as much as community engagement. That there was very little connection to political engagement. And that it, um, whether it's because it's just hard to capture in a photo or not, but there wasn't a lot that captured the intellectual transformation that could be happening as well. So that raises these questions, which we'll think about. And I know Susan's going to be talking next about the work she did. And I think. Um, the work that she did with her staff at the University of Vermont is a nice way of taking these questions seriously. Do the images that we see reflect reality or choices we have um, that we make about representation? Um, do the images reflect what is easy to document? And as someone who's tried to capture photos of service and now knowing what I know, I'm sometimes um, frustrated by what's hard to capture um, in the moment and what you wanna capture about social justice or political engagement related to community engagement. How do these images um, shape who's attracted to service learning and why as a movement that's committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion? How are our images contributing to that or maybe operating at cross purposes? Um, do these images reflect limitations of service learning or just capturing images? Um, are they starting points for interrogating our own practice? How could we use words or text to um, provide more context, which might be really needed to help um, encode some of the images? And um, how can we use images that reflect our desire for service learning among diverse audiences? And so with that, Susan, I know you're gonna talk about some of the work you did to take those questions seriously. Yes, thank you. It's so fun to get to talk about this again. So um, I'm talking about a case study here at the University of Vermont where we had a report that I already mentioned that we had produced on the occasion of receiving the Carnegie Classification for Community Engagement in 2015. I was able to leverage that into not systemic change or a bigger budget, but at least a fancy report for better or for worse. Um, and produced that report thinking about these issues, but without David's um, article to guide me. So as soon as I found David's article, I thought, well, let's apply this to what we produced. We, we did our best to think about images um, and to handle some of the constraints. Um, but um, let me just say in the context here, we're a historically white university and two thirds of our service learning is project-based or consultant model. So if our photos were 98% direct service, that was what we knew that was going to be a dramatic um, misrepresentation of what we actually do here for service learning. And the report itself was constrained by existing materials, the photos we already had, and the need to balance representation across all the units. So I knew that my report was not the ideal I would have chosen to perfectly represent service learning in all its forms, but we'd done our best to be inclusive. And so then we asked students, go ahead, Dave, um, to take a look at this. So um, what you'll see on the next slide um, is our cover. And there's a little poll here. I think Marisol is going to be able to set up the poll where I'm going to ask you to vote on do you give that photo a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or an ambivalent um, as the selection chosen for the cover of our report. And let's see. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to see the results of the poll, Marisol. If you have any ideas, let me know. I will uh, launch it once uh, we give the time. Okay, great. So you can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It's another 20 seconds or so. Okay, so please add your thoughts to the poll. Um, if you can't see the picture, it looks like you can slide over the poll so that you can look at the picture. 
And this was the chosen cover that they um, told me I had to have on the front of my report. That is my university communications. Okay, so interesting. There's a lot of ambivalent, unsure, some thumbs up, some thumbs down. Okay, so I'm going to circle back to go ahead, Dave, um, to the next slide. Um, huh. So using these images as starting points, we used David's study to analyze the report. The students were enrolled in a class on critical perspectives on service learning. Um, we replicated and extended the methods. Go ahead. Um, we coded the photos for content, for the role of who was playing the role, the service, the type of service, whether there was service, the type of service, whether there was political content, and the race and social position of the people depicted. And we also coded the captions because there were captions on almost every photo. And we coded the stories for the following things. The benefits of service learning were described for whom? Were they described for students, for faculty, for community partners? Were quotations included and from whom? Were the challenges connected with service learning described? And were political or contentious issues included? And then over the semester, the students had to draw on the analysis of both photos and the stories to articulate the dominant narrative of service learning as portrayed in the report and to construct a story of their own service learning engagement in a way that enriched, broadened, or challenged the dominant narrative. So that's what we were asking students to do in the class. What we found um, is that there were um, a range, so here are some of the codings that we found. There were photos of people and deliverables. The example at left is a photo of a deliverable from project-based service learning. There were a lot of photos of students, some of staff, some of community partners and alumni. Go ahead. By type, certain, the, um, there were only 19 photos of service. There was an alumni section, so there were a lot of photos of alumni. Of service, of 19 photos of service, six was of direct service, four was of indirect service, and project, there were five photos. And remember, project is, is two-thirds of our service learning, so there should have been closer to 12 photos of project-based service learning. Instead, there's many more pictures of hammers like we saw before. So here, this is a photograph of a project-based service learning and museum costuming um, course. Um, and so 12 should have depicted project-based service learning if we are representative of our campus. Go ahead. Um, in terms of race and social position, um, we found that more people of color were portrayed as having expertise or social power. And um, more, but a large number of white people were service learners or helpers. Um, and relative balance in this last slide, sorry. Um, looking at something here. Um, people being served or helped in some way were about equally split between people who had appeared to be white and people who appeared to be people of color. And some of this, I think, was our own efforts to ensure that um, white people were not the only people portrayed as having expertise or social power. It's also the fact of um, us being both a white dominated university and a historically white state. So there, um, our students doing direct service are not going to be working with only people of color. Um, urban schools are going to be um, racially diverse, including white people. And so it would be very difficult to have actual appropriate representations of service learning that didn't include white people in the served role. Um, so back to the issue of the cover. I was really, and we can go on to the next slide, I was really concerned about the cover because I felt like it was choosing direct service over project-based service learning and it showed um, a person of color being served by a white student. When I talked to our university communications, they invoked a debate that had happened, um, some issues that had occurred over our state's um, magazine, which you see here covered on, see the covers portrayed on the left is a cover um, that's very typical. And if you are familiar with Vermont, very stereotypical of Vermont photographs of our landscapes, our mountains and our fields. On the right, the cover is not one that most people outside of Vermont recognize as being very representative of um, Chittenden County, which is a refugee resettlement county and has um, 
We have folks from 30 countries. There's 40 languages spoken in my daughter's school and this um, King Street Youth Center, which works with um, youth from all over the world is a um, prominent feature of one of our marketplaces. This is a lemonade stand. And um, the publishers of Vermont Life received hate mail for the cover of this magazine. And when I talked to the, our university communications department, they said, we feel it's incredibly important to make sure that photos on the left are not the only representation of the University of Vermont. Regardless of how our alumni might feel, they need to know where Vermont is today. So next slide. So based on their thinking, I thought, you know, it really changed my perspective on the cover. And you'll notice the caption there reads, Saran Chetri, a native of Bhutan, studies for the US citizenship test with the support of UVM student, Eric Benazia. And I love David's point about the work that we might do to help the encoding and the decoding of images, because the word support here, the Refugee is studying, he is being supported by one of our students rather than our student is helping people study for the citizenship test. And so I think like when we code, looking, looking for what's happening in the captions and thinking about how we're, how we're creating those representations is really critical. And they also made the argument to me of, well, we have to have a story about agriculture, but do you want that story about agriculture on the front, which reinforces the dominant narrative about Vermont? Or would you rather have that story um, in the middle where, you know, it, it's, it's necessary because we're the land grant institution, so we're going to have to include that, um, but do you really want that on the front? And those were really interesting, challenging questions for me. So thinking about your own context, what challenges the racial representations in your context? And then who does community engaged work and who is acknowledged for it? The students who um, uh, coded and then audienced our report were somewhat cynical about the representation of people of color in positions of expertise and social power. They felt that we had overrepresented faculty and experts of color in our portrayal. And I think this is a question that we also have to grapple with is that folks from communities of color have often longstanding histories of community engagement. And when those folks are in university settings have a real commitment to use their positionality to bring benefit to the communities from which, of which they're members. And that means that um, on our campus, the faculty who do community engaged scholarship or service learning are disproportionately female and disproportionately people of color. And so I really pushed back on our students, like it may be that this is an overrepresentation, but who do we think does this work? Um, and is it somehow, are, are you somehow seeing this work as less valid because faculty of color are leading it? Like this is a question that um, white students have to ask themselves. Next slide. Um, we coded for content um, around were the stories political and found that in this report there were, um, a f was a fair amount of contentious or political content um, and you can see words that our students circled that they thought had contentious or at least political um, implications and I think in our discussion rather than only being contention we chose to think about were the stories positioning the issues as structural rather than individual. So if a story implied that a social issue was a structural social issues that students were engaging on, uh, engage, engaging with, we would code that as political. And if it portrayed it as an individual um, um, type solution or problem, we put it in the non-contentious. Non um, that could really be rethought and deepened, I think. But um, students took this to be part of our dominant narrative. If you want to look at the next slide. Um, that our dominant narrative was about maintaining our um, image as a progressive or liberal institution. Um, and our students really kind of noted that um, that we may have overstated our level of political engagement or our political liberalism. They had, I think, a very justified kind of um, uh, what's the negotiated relationship with the words that we were that were chosen and with this kind of positioning of us as a progressive or structurally oriented or politically contentious kind of university. Obviously, depending on your context, it may look very, very different. And it was really revealing to me to see 
how boldly many contentious issues were raised. Like for example, um, one of our stories was about um, an alumna who had funded a um, Center for Holocaust Studies and the work that they chose to profile was work noting that many Holocaust survivors um, live in poverty. And that was not like, you know, that was relatively contentious to kind of look at those, to look at those issues. Um, and my students were really struck by it. So next slide. Um, still missing, our students pointed out, and we noticed community partners' voices, experiences, and especially their agency as co-designers of service learning experiences. Especially in project-based service learning, our community partners are sometimes making pitches to students, designing projects, um, laying out what their needs are, providing iterative feedback on products that are being developed, and this was completely invisible um, in our report. Um, and also the challenges or obstacles or limitations of community engaged work are not something you typically find in a celebratory report that's being sent out to all the alumni. Nonetheless, my students noted that it was not, you know, not a prominent feature. So when they were tasked with coming up with alternative narratives, many of my students chose to write articles about mistakes, problems, obstacles, ways they fell short. Um, and then we tried to put those as best we could on our own website so that we could um, take our students' voices to heart and showcase some of our own challenges still. Last slide. And then I'll just end with, a, again, an emphasis on your context. You have to work with what people are expecting. I was told that there absolutely had to be um, one image of Vermont's fall foliage. Um, and this was taken by a drone that is also used in a service learning course. That's the connection. So, um, so there are there are ways that that we will when we're working with other folks at our institution, we may not be able to step outside of that dominant narrative all the time. Mm -hmm. So, and I think now these this is our contact information. I think we're going to open it up to questions. So feel free to type questions and. Um, is that in the chat function? Is that right? In the Q&A function. And uh, we have about five, six minutes for questions. While people are thinking of questions, I'll just offer one thought as Susan was uh, presenting and you were talking about the pressures we feel from other parts of the university, those can be really real. And um, I know, you know, I think about our um, publications, our website and what it means to students and to our community partners, but I know our Office of Development is often thinking about our alumni um, and uh, our alumni of a certain generation actually like to think of themselves, I think, as saviors or don't see that as a problematic stance. And so, um, you know, there are ways in which um, we walk a lot of lines, but also then have to think about if we are using photos because we want to change some of those narratives and we don't want to reinforce a savior narrative, like how do we do that too so that the images can also educate and the text that accompanies them, I think as Susan pointed out, um, that text that accompanied the cover photo was really key to helping reframe how people might think of that picture. Yeah, there's a question. Um, what recommendations do you have for institutions and community engagement offices as a result of this study? So what are some takeaways? I mean, you know, I would read David's article <laughs> to start and then pull together the most diverse group of students you can find and put photos in front of them and um, ask them their reactions and you know empower service learning classes to create their own um, visual representations of their own learning process I mean it'd be such an interesting such an interesting thing to try to turn visual representation into a tool for critical reflection yeah, I think that comment you made about having diverse um, staff working on these products really makes a huge difference. I know here at the McCarthy Center, um, it's the diversity of the staff that I think has really helped us think differently about um, all our publications and including our web publications. I'm seeing a question, are our findings also representative in university social media pages? And 
I mean, I haven't done anything empirical to answer that question. I suspect they might, although it's interesting to think about who controls some of those social media pages. I mean, there are um, social media which are controlled by offices of marketing and communication. And then there, um, I know here at the McCarthy Center, we've turned ours over on occasion with university permission that was not easy to negotiate to students to just curate themselves for a week at a time. And, um, you know, then they look differently too. Yep. One of my colleagues, so I'm on the fact, on the academic affairs side, my colleague here in student affairs um, does trainings for student, uh, alternative spring break student leaders about what kinds of images are appropriate to share from alternative spring break and from service trek and other volunteer programs. And um, I think that's really excellent to get students thinking about how they're taking pictures before they go on trips. Um, so I think folks doing that kind of work, it, it's really necessary because um, they're running, you know, social media campaigns, hashtags, and et cetera, and really getting students thinking before those photos just come flying is really important. It's a question about should there be um, photo policies for service trips and community service programs? And one of the things we do is we work with our community partners, so especially ones working with youth. So when they are, the youth are signing up for these uh, programs, they're also, um, their parents are probably signing a waiver saying that they understand that um, photos can be used in, um, a variety of ways, including on web pages or whatever. And there's an opt out if parents don't want their um, children included, and so we can respect that. But it allows us to then have access to more photos. The other thing we do is um, we found if we relied on the university to send a photographer, A, we couldn't guarantee there would be one. And if they did, we couldn't guarantee they would capture what we wanted them to. And so um, one of the smart investments we've made, I think, is um, hiring our own cadre of on call student photographers and giving them shot lists where we as a staff think about what are the kinds of things we want to get so that um, we can help our photographer look at things with the same eyes that we have now and try to capture some of those. It's really important to listen to community partners in addition to the issues of youth. For us, we have students working um, at times with migrant dairy farm workers on farms, and it's absolutely critical that photos not reveal anything about the location of the farm, that the students not have out-of-state license plates, and the community partners are the ones who've really educated us about what we need to do so that we aren't endangering um, undocumented folks. So um, so there's just there's a whole lot of... Um, really important issues and listening to community partners can be a very important place to start. There was a question, um, the VISTA leader about uh, sharing resources with VISTA members, make them aware of this as well. Um, this uh, webinar will be, uh, is being recorded and will be posted uh, on the compact.org website. So you can find that and share it with uh, VISTA members or others um, following this webinar. Great. Any last questions? Perfect. Well, I'll, if I, if I, if I might, I'll just add in terms of photo policies. I, I think my, my colleague in Alternative Spring Breaks has a, um, has a bingo sheet and it's like the photo shoot list. You get, you fill out bingo, you get like bingo cards to get to win the bingo if you get certain photos or get certain quotes or um, relate, get kind of information or, or, or the like. And so that can be a really fun way of encouraging students to think more critically, but to also get those photos that you need for whatever, whatever purposes you have. And I've also been a lot more active with faculty about getting student deliverables because student deliverables can often be very beautiful visual images of posters or design work or the, the one you saw on the slide is engineering designs. There's no reason it has to be of students or of people to represent some of what service learning is about. Would, uh, would so the question is, would Compact post a general photo policy sheet for people to build on? Um, yeah, we can explore that or have folks share theirs and we can be a resource for um, putting those on there. We can do a call out to members. All right, so we're just about at time. So I just wanna thank our presenters uh, so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise um, on this content and having us think of, you know, deeply about, um, let me get, you can see. Uh, have us, having us think deeply about the images that we're using and what they portray and the impacts that they have.
It was truly engaging and meaningful, and I want to thank attendees for your participation and engagement in the webinar. Um, I also want to encourage and attendees to fill out the evaluation survey that they'll be receiving shortly following this webinar. So thank you, and we have another webinar coming up uh, on the 26th, and that one will be on uh, the census. Um, so looking forward to seeing everyone, and thank you.